And this action is stemming out of a vision that I saw, or one of the visions that I saw while I was there. And I just want to encourage you all that, you know, there are certain times wherein one of the ways by which we begin to see visions is to recognize where we're at. You know that Bennett, where he's sitting right now, he doesn't have an expectation of seeing the Statue of Liberty where he's at because of his location. But the moment you start getting close to where an object is situated, you begin to have an expectation to see it, especially if you've been told that it is there. And so a lot of what the hand of God has proposed to do in our lives becomes visible when you are in the presence of God. So one of the ways by which we begin to see visions is by learning how to press in when you recognize where you are. When the presence of the Lord is in a place, it is not uncommon for you to begin to see angels and for you to even see and hear the voice of God more audibly. As so I want to encourage you, if that is not something that you have made a, a custom, begin to cultivate it. And for some reason, I keep feel like turning back to address your because the ministry that you occupy, you go from place to place being a blessing in the area of the minstrel ministry. But by minstrels, you are one of the most strategically positioned people to see and hear God. As so I want to encourage you, let this be the season wherein you stand out from among the crowd. It is not just your skill that will make you stand out, but it is the anointing. You see, because there are many skilled people out there who have yet to submit their skill to the Lord and by so doing limit how much of the Lord can be expressed through their art and through their trade and through other facets of their lives. But when you know who you are and whose you are, then your eyes begin to open. Let me tell you this, Apostle Paul, while he was still a persecutor, he was operating based on emotions and based on the flesh and based on religious convictions but the moment he saw the Lord and the Lord says hey 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 we're supposed to be on the same side he says why are you kicking against the gods I am the one whom you persecute that very moment he switched his allegiance around and shortly afterwards he began to see the scale that were upon his eyes did not just get there the moment Jesus appeared when Jesus appeared he, the appearing of the Lord revealed his blindness he was blind and did not even know it and that was why he was kicking against the gods because he wanted to make progress for God but blindly he was kicking when he was supposed to be soaring and many of us have kicked enough it's time for us to be able to move upon our right places eyes will be open in here today in the mighty name of Jesus so I want us to do some marching around but I want to help you a little bit here with what I saw what I saw was a long line of an army an army an ancient army that stood they dressed like it was summer, but in reality it was winter. It was very cold, but they were not perturbed. They were not bothered by it. They looked like they were just rocketized human beings. And the Lord said to me, he says, some have been marching out of step. He said, but now listen, the moment they hear the sound, all the steps will sink up. And so I just want you to do this action just to tap into the revelation of what the Lord is doing with his church tonight. And just take one step after another and march like you are in an army. You're not doing this because you're in a physical army, but you're doing this because you want every part of you to witness to what the Lord is saying. I am in the Lord's army and I will march to the sound of his call in the mighty name of Jesus. I want you to say that I am in the Lord's army and I will march to the sound of his call. I will not hear another but I will hear the sound of the good shepherd. I will hear the sound of Yeshua, the captain of my salvation and I will march to the beat of this victory in the mighty name of Jesus. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Let's all be seated. God is good. Amen, amen, amen. Praise the Lord. God is good. All right, Bennett, I don't think um, I'm going to give you any, you know, cues. So if you want to just transition, you're free to do so. Because I just have a series of visions that I want to share with us tonight. Uh, one of the things that I saw is what I just shared with you, but it didn't end there. The Lord took me higher. 
and I saw the army from a higher perspective. And do you know that what seemed to be a line was a ring? It was a ring. And Jesus said to me, he says, now you see the reason why I said, when I return, will I find faith on the earth? What he showed to me was that the further we have been from the first coming of the Lord Jesus, the more faint his voice has become in the ears and in the hearts of people. You see, Jesus came about 2,000 years ago. And over the passage of time, the voice of the good shepherd, the call of the captain of our salvation has become drowned in the midst of the noise of deception and the chaos of Babylon. To the point wherein believers who are supposed to live by his word no longer hear him as clearly. And that is the reason why there are soldiers in the army of God who are not marching to the beat and the command of the captain. Because it's such a long line that it's actually curved around and looping upon itself. And I said, Lord, the ones that are marching in front of us who seem to be closer to you, their feet are not even touching the ground. He says, yes, he says, those are the ones who have come ahead of you who have already been taken up. But the ones who are farthest away in line are the ones whose boots are still on the ground with the dust and the mud of the earth. I said, what do we do? He said, look again, what have I taught you? And that was when I realized that even though we seem to be the furthest away from the manifestation of the glory of God, we happen also to be the closest because it's a ring. And he just said to me, he said, I just need you all to turn around and you will hear me from here rather than from there. Let me explain that because some of us may not be as uh, graphical yet. We're getting there. So if you weren't able to paint that picture, let me help you a little bit. You see, let's even take this communion house logo, for example. Now, if I move too close there, I may be out of Joshua's shot. So I'm going to point from here. You see, the thing about a ring or a circle is the closest two points on a circle are also the two furthest points on the circle. Right? The closest points on a circle are also the furthest points. So what makes the difference? Direction. Right? Brother Matthew, come, let me use you as an example. Alan, come, let me use you as an example. This is how we test whether they have repented. Yeah, let's try again. Let us try again. Uh, Cody and Charles, can you do me a favor and see if you can lower this thing because I want people to see the two of them and I don't want this thing to get in the way. We'll just lower it for a moment and if you can sit up front so once we're done, you can help us bring it back. That would be great. I want both of you to stand back to back. Wow. Can we just celebrate these guys, everybody? We have made so much progress. Praise God. Now they're standing back to back and let's align this thing because in the video later, it's going to bother me. Alrighty. Yeah, it is what it is. I used to deny my attention to detail, but now I've come to embrace it. Now, with where they're standing, it is very difficult, almost an impossible, for Alan to see Matthew and for Matthew to see Alan. Now, be at a 30 degree angle, just like that, and you two at a 30 degree angle. Perfect, there you go. I mean, these guys are born again. Now, the way they are now, they are on points. Initially, they were point on, on a point, or they were on two points on the line because they were parallel to one another back to back. But at an angle now, they are now on points, they are on two points on a circle. What do I mean by that? If you imagine where Matthew is facing, Brother Matthew looking this way, this line goes around and it comes back to where Alan is. It's a ring but they still can't see each other that easily simply because they are on the two points of the circle that are furthest away from each other. So the Lord Jesus started from here, leading an army and over the passage of time, we have had such a long line of people who are now at this point hardly able to discern what he is saying. In fact, Jesus says they will not even be able to see me. It's, that's why he pronounced a blessing, a future blessing. He says, blessed are those who will believe even though they do not see. 
You understand what I mean? He was speaking about us. He says, blessed are those. Charles, can you let me take that so that I don't uh, baptize myself? Thank you. He says, blessed are those who will believe whilst haven't yet seen. So what the Lord revealed to me was this. He said, those of us who seem to be the farthest away. The reason why we seem to be farthest away is because of the passage of time. But then at the same time, we are the most privileged. The Bible says they are most privileged upon whom the end of the ages have come. You would have thought it was a disadvantage to be that far removed from the Lord. But we also are the closest to him because his return is near. Now let's watch this. Alan, why don't you just turn around where you're at and face Brother Matthew. And Brother Matthew turn around and face Alan. Now they have suddenly become the two closest people in the room. Whatever one says, the other will hear. Praise the Lord, go seated. Go get seated. God bless you. Thank you, Jesus. Alrighty, thank you, Charles. Yeah, these guys have, they should get a sticker after the service. And now, the Lord Jesus said to me, continuing in that vision, he said to me, he said, the people that were alive when John the Baptist came, were the furthest away from the miracles of Exodus. They were the furthest away from the miracle of the faith of Noah that brought about a new beginning. And that was the reason why it was said that in those days the word of the Lord had become extremely scarce. It had become so rare that certain scribes recorded in their journals that no man had heard the voice of God for 400 years. Because between Malachi and John, there were 400 years. 400 years, no one had heard the voice of God. Why? Because they had become the furthest generation of people away from the last testaments of God's intervention. And so they had forgotten what it meant to hear the voice of God. They no longer recognize what it means to experience the move of God. They were only able to continue to compose themselves by the ordinances of religion. They were just doing everything religiously. Do you know that when you look around, there are times wherein we have come to church just because we know the word of God says we should. Not because the last time you were at church, you felt the touch. Not because the last time you were at church, not here, every time you come here, you feel the touch of God. Praise the Lord. But we know that we've gone through times wherein we're just literally going through the motions. And there's nothing wrong with it because there are times wherein we get tested to see whether we are there for the bread or whether we are there for the Lord. And that was why Jesus says, blessed are those who believe even without having seen. Look at us, how many miracles have we seen and yet we believe. And that is the reason why when the day comes and we stand side by side with the likes of Apostle Paul and Father Abraham, we will not feel like second hand or second class citizens. Simply because they would look at us and they would give us a commendation because they would ask how we did it whilst having yet seen. <laughs> you know, if you don't know how God operates, you will feel at a disadvantage. Like how do I even stand next to people? You know, I've told you before. That is one of the things that I think about. Sometimes I rehearse in my mind what conversations I'm going to have with Enoch when I see him. What conversations I'm going to have with Job when I see him. Because I know one day I'm going to be with these guys and they will be with me because it is the promise of the Lord to you as a believer that you will be in the company of just men made perfect. You will be in the company of innumerable angels. Are you waiting until the day to begin to see yourself in the day? No, you need to begin to see yourself there now. The Lord God Almighty made it such that we have been told by the apostles and the prophets to prepare for the day of the Lord. By thinking about it, the Bible says, let your attention be on things above and not on things beneath. The only time you think about what you will say is when you're thinking of standing in front of your boss to request for a pay rise. How you're going to make a story up for your landlord for why you're falling behind. No, we can't continue to remain in the mundane. We are kings and priests unto our God. And there is a holy convocation that we have been invited to. How well are we preparing for it? Recently, I was talking to my brother when I shared this experience with you. He said, I wonder how these men of God who are becoming rich by preaching the gospel 
will stand before the likes of Apostle Paul who became poor by preaching the gospel. And that really wrecked me. Because I'm like Paul says, by the, by, he said by the preaching of the gospel, we have become poor so that you can be rich. Rich in what? In the things of the kingdom. Rich in the righteousness of the kingdom. He didn't say so that you can line your pockets with money. Because you know sometimes the more money we have, the more dull our hearts are to the things of God. Because what many of us have yet to learn is how to have money without money having us. But do we not know that it takes skill, it takes divine intelligence, which is called wisdom, and absolute surrender to God for you to have money and for money to not have you. Now you think you're staying up late thinking about how you're going to get money. God help you. <laughs> By the time you get the kind of money that you're dreaming about, then you lose more sleep because now you're thinking about how you're not going to lose it. And then you're thinking about how to ward off all the dogs that will come after you. Because the moment you get money, all the ahinas will come after you. All the jackals will come after you. There are people waiting in the bush, just waiting for you to have a little bit of money. They're waiting to come after you. They want to sell you things that you do not need and they want to convince you that if you do not invest with them, you'll be doomed. After a while, you start wondering if it's a blessing or a curse. But when, you, when God knows that you have schooled your heart or allowed your heart to be schooled by God in the things of the kingdom such that money will not have you, then he will let you have money. Because God is not going to give to you more than you can handle. He's not that kind of daddy. But Satan will because Satan is like, wow, this person keeps thinking about money. Maybe we'll give them some. And then they will never think about God again. Do you know how many people that mammon has become a god to simply because everything that they want, mammon can answer it for them and they're like, why do I even need God? Or maybe this is God. But let me tell you something. I think about these things and I practice speaking to these guys. But over the years, I've come to recognize that I will not feel inferior when I stand before them simply because the time that I am living in is such a time that they could not even imagine. Remember the prophet of the Lord who says, I have made a covenant with my eyes that I would not look upon a woman lustfully. He said, because the daughters of the city have brought suffering to my soul. Imagine if he lives in this time wherein even when you're not talking about the daughters of the city, the ones who are supposed to be the daughters of the kingdom, you come into church and they're not dressed any better. The other day I was watching a, a, t a movie from like 1984, 85. And I said to my wife, I said, these people are supposed to be unbelievers. That's supposed to be a club. And it looks even more, it looks cleaner than churches today. Because everybody was still wearing baggy. You don't see nobody's anything. I say all of that to say that we have come full circle. And Jesus said when those people came in the generation of John, they were the furthest away from the light of the appearing of God or the appearances that God made to his children. So they had become accustomed to just guessing their way through things. They felt like they were so far away from the things of God. And what did God do to remedy the situation? To help them. He sent to them John, the voice of him crying in the wilderness. And what did John tell them to do? John tapped them on the shoulder and told them to turn around. And the moment they turned around, what did they see? The Bible says they beheld his glory and it was the glory of the Son of God. They were looking this way for the longest, but God wanted them to turn around so that they can see that he had already come behind them. We are that generation that Jesus has already come close to again, but he is behind us because he's coming in such a way that is different from what we have been expecting. He's coming in such a way that is more refreshing than what we have received. Many of us are still looking at the religious ordinances and the liturgies that we have inherited and the Lord Jesus is saying all I need you to do is repent turn around and you will behold my glory once again I guarantee you one thing folks the reason why we are where we are is because we do not know where we are I'm going to explain that and then we're going to read some scripture 
The reason why when Matthew was standing here and Alan was standing there, the reason why they did not know how to see the other person was because they did not know that they were standing at the two closest points because the world told them it's the two furthest points. It is all about direction. It is all about where you are facing. If you turn around as the Lord is asking you to turn around, then you will recognize that the Lord is closer than you thought. Jacob was looking to experience God the way that Abraham experienced God. And the Abrahamic encounters of God were getting so far away in the distance that they were dimming out and he did not know until he got to Bethel and he had to turn around. And what happened when he turned around? He was like, oops, the Lord was here and I knew it not. As soon as we started worship, even before the singing while Alan was here, I heard that sound. And you know what? That sound came from within me and it wrecked me. Why? Because since the Lord said there will be a sound, I have been trying to figure out how the sound was going to come. And the sound came from within me. And immediately I knew exactly what the Lord had done. The Bible says when the day of Pentecost was fully come, they were together in one place and in one accord. And there came from heaven a sound as of a rushing mighty wind. But when that sound has already come and it hasn't gone anywhere, then where do we find it? If not within us, where it's been sitting, waiting to be roused. And when that sound came from here, I was reminded that out of my belly shall flow rivers of living waters. And the Lord would have me say to you that the sound that he promised is a response to the sound that you will make. Because when you make that sound by faith and in obedience, you will hear what God is saying unto the churches. And the moment you hear it, it will break the burdens and it will break the yokes and lift the burdens. It is called the anointing. Where is Jesus Christ? Where's Christ? He's inside of you. And what is Christ? Christ means the anointing. The word Christ means the anointing and the anointed one. And so if the anointing breaks the yoke, how does it do it? The Bible says by reason of the anointing. So when the anointing rises within you, it becomes the ultimate fulfillment of all conditions needed for burdens to be lifted and for yokes to be broken. But it needs to rise from within you and you need to hear the voice of God as it pertains to your very unique existence. When I heard that sound, I couldn't stand anymore. Thank you, Alan, for coming to stand next to me. I felt your presence next to me because I was going like this and like that I was blown back and forth simply because where I was was no longer where I stood. And I'm going to share two more things with you if the Lord lets me on the second one. But the first one I'm going to share with you some of the things that I saw while I was there. The Lord said to me, He said, what was I telling you before you left home? Pretty much all through the morning, beginning from the early hours of this morning. In fact, I think it started a little bit last night, but I wasn't paying attention to it as much because I wanted to sleep. I hadn't slept for a couple of days properly. So when that conversation started last night, I was like, no, I want to sleep. Because I knew the reason why I didn't sleep for like two, three days, I wasn't sleeping much. And the reason was this, I decided to start doing something more consistently. And the Lord says, yes, I can share it with you all. And you know what I started doing more consistently? Remember that I told you that there is a shift in the heavens once it is midnight. And it is not something that you have to believe. It is something that you have to try. You know, thank God we're believers. But we don't always have to just believe everything. There are certain things that we have to try. When it comes to the issue of worshiping God with our substance, God says, bring all the tithes into the storehouse and try me if I will not open the windows of heaven. He didn't say believe that if you tithe, you'll be blessed. No, he says you try it. It is not a doctrine. It is, it is a principle. So there are certain things that we try. You understand what I mean? He says try. And so when I'm telling you that there is a shift in the heavens, try it. Stay up or pray from midnight to about 1 a.m. in the morning. Do that for like three months and then see where your life will be. Do 
you know that demons are seen by heaven as flies? That was why when Jesus was casting out demons, they said he must be doing it by the powers of the Lord of the flies. Beelzebub, right? And what are flies in the face of fire? You can't have fire and have flies come on the fire. No, flies go onto things that are filthy and cold. Which is what a lot of us have become because we have allowed our light to go out because of the cares of this world and we have allowed our garments to be soiled by the love of the same. And that is the reason why the flies come. And when the flies come, what do they do? The Bible says, behold the flies. They cause the oil of the apothecary to send forth a stinking smell. What is the oil of the apothecary? The oil of the apothecary is the raw material for making the anointing oil. And so while God is still working in you and forging his glory within you, you let the flies come and they corrupt the oil of the anointing. And how do you keep them away? By standing in the ring of his fire. And how do you light up the fire of your life? By praying in the Holy Ghost. The Bible says when you build yourself up on your most holy faith, you do that by praying in the Holy Ghost. Why is it most holy? Simply because it is fire and no flies can come around it. Someone says, how do you know that speaking in tongues is fire? Because I've seen it. And also because the Bible says that there appeared upon them divided tongues as a fire and they all spoke with a new tongue. When you speak in tongues, it, it increases the intensity of the flame that is on the candle of your spirit. The Bible says that the spirit of man is the candle of the Lord with which he searches the inward parts of his belly. So your spirit is essentially a candle that has flame on it. And someone was like, oh, I thought my spirit was more than that. Well, do not think of yourself more highly than you ought to. Even the spirits of God are represented by a candle. When you look at the, temp the tabernacle in the wilderness, the seven golden lampstands, what did they say? What did the Bible say that they represent? They represent the seven spirits of God. Even God's own spirit is represented with a candle. And that is what you are. But many of us, because we do not see ourselves as candles, that is the reason why our light goes off because we allow a lot of wind that is contrary to come into our soul and it quenches the flame. You need to learn how to pray and to keep the night watch so that your flame can burn as it should. I told you that a couple of months ago. And so one of the things that I started doing was this. I thought to myself, it just came as a thought to me. Now wait a minute, if everybody is crashing that gate at 12, it reminded me of the days that we used to go clubbing. All things have passed away, all things are new. But still we have the stories to tell of his grace. Y'all know that song? No, you don't because I just made it up. Yeah, all things have passed away, but we still have the stories to tell of his grace. When we, oh, testimonies, yeah, come on, thank you. Praise God. And that is what we would do. If the club is opening at 11 and you don't want to be in that long line and you want to enjoy the half prices on the things that are inside, what do you do? You get there before they raise the price and before they lock the door. Because they lock the door to keep people out in the, in the cold so as to be able to make it look like something is really happening there. Yep, how do I know that? Because I've read it in the book. <laughs> yeah, they lock the door and make you people stand in the long line so that the people driving by, they're like, man, hey dude, that's where it's happening. Nothing is happening there. It's just an illusion. Maybe we need to do that at church. Make people line up in the parking lot so when people are passing, they're like, oh, something must be going on in there. I want to go and find out what is going on in there. But if you want to beat the crowd and at least be already in the spirit of alcohol before people come, you get in there early. So you beat the rush. And so I decided, I said, I want to beat the rush. So I started my own prayers at 11.30. I want the front row seat. And that's what's been going on with me and that is the reason why I have not been sleeping that much because when you get in there that early, you see everything. You're not having to ask somebody like Brother Matthew who is taller than life to sit down so that you can see what is going on because you have the front row seat. Now this is the revelation of the front row for both of you because I was talking to you about front row sitting earlier. I tell you what, having the front row seat 
And then when I'm done praying, sometimes at 2 o'clock or 2.30, I'm like, okay, now how do you sleep after such an experience? I remember the other day I had just finished praying and my body was tired and I knew that I needed to sleep, but my soul was on so much joy, ecstasy, that I was dancing with a tired body and my legs were wobbling. So last night, I'm like, I'm not gonna do that again. I was taking a break. So I prayed earlier, before the show started. I was like, I'm still gonna pray so that I could go to bed. The conversation started and I'm like, no, not today. But this morning, I knew that that conversation was inevitable. And the Lord said to me, and he asked me, he said, tell me exactly how you feel. I said, to be honest, sometimes I feel like we have been left alone for too long. Because when you think about how powerful, so to speak, the children of this world have become. Because their revival happened before our revival. The Bible says that power was given to the dragon, the serpent of old, to deceive the nations. So the power of deception was given, and so they had that leg up, so to speak, of beginning their oppression before our own revival started. And that is the reason why it appears as though whenever we want to speak, they shut us down. It appears as though wherever we turn, they're already there. They have mounted all their guards around to make our lives so constricted. Now, if you don't feel the constraint, it's probably because you are giving in too much to Satan. Because if you are not giving in too much to Satan, and if you have not bought into the deception, you will know that we are at war and there is so much opposition. The Bible says, Paul speaking, he says we are pressed on every side. He said, but we're not caving in. We are indeed pressed on every side. If you don't feel that, then that means you have become dull of heart. Jesus said it in Luke, I believe 21. He said, let me tell you, you can't let yourself be drunk with the wine of their carousing, particularly in the end. There is a wine of carousing that the world has sent out. The, the spate of entertainment and this plague of deception. Many people are just having a good time. They're going with the flow. Dead to the things of God. But when you're alive to the things of God, you will know this is not how it's supposed to be. This place doesn't look like heaven in any way. This is not how we're supposed to be. This is not the will of my heavenly father. I am not supposed to be this much away from my children. I am not supposed to be this much away from the presence of God. But the system around me is designed so that I'm everywhere else but where I need to be. And so I said to God, you want to know? This is exactly how I feel. I feel like we have been left in here for too long. But even myself, while I yet spoke, I repented and I said, but how else would we be stronger? How else would we build muscle? How else would we appreciate the value system of God? If we have not been so hated by the world, how would we appreciate the unconditional love of God? If we have not been without, then how would we appreciate the supernatural providence of heaven when it comes? It is okay for us to be hard pressed on every side because by such presses, we're building the right sense of appreciation for what it means to be set free. And so I say to you folks today, that as the, con the conversation went on, the Lord said to me, he said, because of where you have been looking, and what you have been singing, I appear to be far. He says, but I am never away from you. You know what God's name is? He is called the ever-present help in time of need. So the Lord is with you. And the question is, what are you doing about it? And you know, let me now tell you something that happened to me. This must have been about one or two o'clock thereabouts. As soon as that understanding hit me, I was like, oh, so even though I think I've been praying more, I'm still not praying enough. I said, okay, I got you. I'm going to hit you up later. That was what I told God. 
I said, so what I'm going to do is I will make some more time and then I'm going to talk about some of the things that you want to talk about. You see, when God is talking to me, I look to him. Let me explain what I've just said. You see, when my wife is talking to me sometimes, or at least before I knew what I was doing, I was, I'm like, yeah, you're talking. I can hear you, but I'm still looking at the TV. I can hear you. I'm still sorting through files. And then after a while, I realized that then she would stop talking. And I'd be like, keep talking. I was listening. And she'd be like, no, never mind. When you're more attentive, when you're more interested, basically what she was saying is that if you're not looking at me, I ain't talking. And so I've learned, which is interesting because my mom used to say to us when we were children, she would say conversation is not in the ear, it's in the eyes. That's why till today, especially since the advent of video calls, my brother would not talk on the phone if he can't see you. Unless there is just no way for him to do a video call. And that's also because he's very expressive. He likes to do this and that when he's talking and he wants you to see everything. You see what I mean? But let me tell you something. It is so true with God. When you, when David was talking about being in the presence of God, he wasn't as concerned about hearing what God was saying as much as seeing what was going on in the heart of God. He said that I may behold the beauty, the beauty of the Lord. When David found himself in the presence of God and God was talking, he was always just like, oh my God, how beautiful is this God? You try that with your wives at home, she will start to be better to you. You understand what I mean? Men, married men in the house, and the ones who are getting ready, like Charles is doing his press up, getting ready for marriage, he's warming up. Because I told him, I said, this year, God willing, we will have to marry you off if you remain single. Oh, you're recording to send to some other people. Yeah, we will, we will have to find a wife and just bring it to them. Some men, we have to go take them from their fathers and mothers. The Bible says a man shall leave his father and mother. We will come and drag you out because you have to do the will of your heavenly father. The Bible says it is not good for a man to be alone. We would, if we have to come and drag you. Some people are going out to mission field. We will pray for your wife to be waiting for them. Praise the Lord. But then at the end of the day, <laughs> when the Lord is speaking, you need to have a sense of beholding the beauty of the Lord. And you know what I saw as the Lord was speaking to me about myself? I started to see what was in his heart and it was people. It was people, different people, different things going on with people and the need for an intercession. For an intercessor. Now I know that Jesus forever lives to make intercessions for us. But Jesus says, I am going to the heavenly father. Greater works than I did shall you do. When he was here, he interceded for us. So now that he's gone, we need to carry on the intercession and even do greater. Because we always think that greater works is just healing the sick and raising the dead. Let me tell you something. People don't need physical healing as much as they need emotional healing, as much as they need spiritual healing. And so we're waiting for the power that we can show on television. Say, I just prayed for that guy in the wheelchair and he stood up. But everybody else that is sitting around you cannot even hear God clearly and you're pulling one man from the wheelchair. Now that he's out of the wheelchair. And so what? Is Jesus coming to save those legs or is he coming for that soul? The Bible says he that wins the soul is wise. In Daniel chapter 12, the Bible says, I beheld the sons of God, the ones who were soul winners, and their light was like the stars of the heavens. He didn't say the miracle workers. The miracle workers came to Jesus and said, oh Jesus, we did miracles in your name. And Jesus said, and so what? He said, depart from me, you workers of iniquity, for I do not know you. He said, but these ones, when I was hungry, they fed me. When I was naked, they clothed me. Jesus is talking about the ones that minister to the heart as opposed to the ones that do a demonstration for self-aggrandizement. All of these things will happen, but they have to happen in the right order. Let's raise people up first because the Bible says we live, we prosper and live in health as our soul prospers. God forbid that we continue to heal people of physical infirmities while their souls are rotten away. And so when I saw what was in the heart of the Lord, I continued in my previous trajectory and I said, okay, I'm going to make more time. I'm going to make more time. I was already thinking of how to cover time to do that. And suddenly, let me tell you something. You know that man is a spirit that lives in the body and has a soul. And so sometimes you are there enjoying what the Lord is saying and then you come to your spiritual senses. I came to my spiritual senses in a moment 
And I thought to myself, why do I want to catch up with the Lord later when I have his attention already? And in that very moment, I started to pray for people. I started to call out names of people and I started to prophesy. I started to pray. I started to pray. I started to pray and prophesy. I tell you what, ladies and gentlemen, God is looking for those that will engage him. The people that will recognize that he is close. The people that will turn around and just see that, oh Jesus, you've been here the entire time. Thank you for waking me up, for allowing me to recognize the privileges that I have in you. I will no longer sorrow. I will no longer cry, but I will pray and engage you in a conversation because that is the only way to make it the Bible says men ought always to pray and not to faint so it is with joy that I announce to you folks that the Lord is calling us to repentance and the moment we repent guess what we are saved from whatever might have been holding us back this is a good segue to the next thing that the Lord showed to me the next thing the Lord showed to me was I saw people that were held back by chains that were bigger than them I've never seen a thing like that before I'm not just talking about little chains, but these chains were mightier than the men and the women that were being held by the chains. And I was like, Ooh, this is serious. Even though on Saturday, the Lord said to me, tell your brothers and sisters to come because they will hear a sound today that will break the chains that have been holding them back. I didn't see chains that big. I just heard the voice of God. But when I saw the chains, I'm like, my God, these chains, but I have learned not to describe what I see, but to speak the word of God. Because you know, sometimes you, you are busy describing to God what you see and God is like, I'm not blind. Just tell me what your desire is. Speak my word back to me. And so when I saw the chains, I looked to the Lord and the Lord said to me, he says, see the wind. I know this is contrary to some of your theology. Because we always talk about not looking at the wind. Because the Bible says the moment Peter looked away from Jesus, he saw the wind and he began to sink. That is the wind that is contrary. The reason why the Bible would describe that wind as contrary is because there is a wind that is what? That is complementary. A wind that is on your side. And that is the wind of the Holy Spirit. And I saw that wind and it brought a sound. But it's more like a sound that comes with the wind. Remember Acts chapter 2, the Bible says, and there came from heaven a sound as of a what? Rushing mighty wind. And the moment the wind got to where the men were who were held back by the chains, something within them started to move along with the wind. And they didn't have to worry about the chains. The chains broke on their own. Let me tell you something. What God wants to do, he has already done but the way you will come to actualize or realize it in your lives is if your focus is on him and not on your problems. If we would just hear the sound of the beating of the heart of God to pray in these last days concerning the things that are important to God, all those are our own problems that seem bigger than us will be broken without us even laying hands on an axe. I will say all of that again because it holds the key to deliverance in this season. Many of us, we want to pray. And in fact, we have been praying. But a lot of our prayers have been about us. You see the way some of us pray. You know why we pray the way we pray? Because we were raised up to make money. Everything, you ask a little child, oh, what do you want to do in college? Oh, I want to do this. Why? I hear that he pays a lot of money. When was the last time you heard somebody say they want to go and do a particular degree or course at the university because they recognize that they have been gifted in that area and they want to sharpen their skills so that they can give their lives to their generation? No, it's all about, oh, he pays a lot of money. People are changing their careers every day. Are you tired doing what you're doing? No, not really. But I hear that if I do this course and that course, I'm going to make more money. So because we have been trained to make money, guess what? We pray like people praying to mammon as opposed to people praying to God. We pray in money. We think in money. We're always praying to receive. Because when it comes to the system of mammon, it's all about how much money you can get and how much money you can keep. Whereas in the kingdom of God, it is all about how much of you you can give and how much of you you can keep giving. 
You understand what I mean? And that is the reason why we pray the way we pray. But when you look at the principle of money making and you understand the truth about money making, what is the difference? You see, in this life, if you make money, only you get affected. Someone is like, oh, but I can give to people. Yeah, most of the time when we give to people, we give to them because of us because it makes us feel better. And it makes them bother us less. You understand what I mean? But the money is coming to you. You see, when people dedicate themselves to mammon, they make money. But when you dedicate yourself to God, you make progress. When you focus on praying for just things that have to do with you, only you get blessed. Nobody else makes progress. But we have come to a time wherein the Lord is looking not just to raise people, but to raise an army. That is the reason why your focus have to, has to shift from asking God's help for dealing with your financial situations. Asking for God's help in dealing with your children. You need to learn how to surrender your own help to God in dealing with what the church is being faced with. I know it may sound like a cliche to seek first the kingdom of God and its righteousness. But that is what the word of God says. Many of us will notice after a while of living as intercessors that some of the problems that we had, we can't even remember what they were anymore simply because the Lord has dealt with them. If you seek first the kingdom of God and its righteousness, every other thing shall be added unto you. I'm not talking about seeking the kingdom of God so that God can see that you're praying for other people but in reality, in your heart, you're still bringing your own problems. I'm talking about allowing yourself to be with God and to see what is in his heart and to say, God, I see this is going on in the world. Let me give you an example of the prayer that I prayed this afternoon, the moment that hit me and I decided that I was not going to catch up with God later, that I was going to pray immediately. I said, God, I know that you see all of the opposition that is in the world. How we are pressed on every side. How it seems that the enemy is mightier than us. I said, Lord, let us remember that you are the glory and the lifter of our heads. And I started to mention the names of people. I started to pray for the ones that the Lord was revealing to me from his heart. That they may receive strength from within to stand against opposition. It is not the kind of prayer that we usually pray, but it is the kind of prayer that we need to pray. One last thing, come with me to the book of Psalms chapter 18. Actually, let's go to 118. We're going to read Psalms 118 verse 2. And look at what it says. It says, let Israel... Now say his mercy and Dios forever. Now let the house of Aaron now say his mercy and Dios forever. Let those who fear the Lord now say his mercy and Dios forever. I've shared this passage of scripture with us in the past when it comes to learning the heart of intercession. You see, the Lord God Almighty is looking for witnesses who will say on the earth what God is saying in the heavens. What God really wants to do is to have mercy upon all because the Bible says God desires to show mercy than to bring judgment. Jesus said it to the Pharisees. He says, if you know what it means that the Lord desires mercy over judgment, you will not castigate the guiltless. God wants to show mercy. But then the mercy of God is only going to be realized in this life when you and I as kings and priests unto our God begin to intercede and declare the mercy of God upon lives upon the earth. And the moment you do that, guess what? Every one of your distress will become a thing of the past. Look at what it says in verse 5. It says, I called on the Lord in distress. The Lord answered me and set me in a broad place. 
What did I tell you earlier about what the system of the world is doing to us? The system of the world over the years, over centuries, they have mounted barricades, restricting us from enjoying the fullness of what God has for us. And I'm not just talking about people, I'm talking about Satan and his cohorts trying to steal the earth from the sons of men. All of those things have restricted us, but the Lord wants to bring us to a broad place. And for us to come to that broad place, the chains have to be broken. And what will break the chains? Verses 2, 3, and 4 has they have to happen before verse 5. We need to intercede and pray for mercy. And this is what the Lord says. He says, when I hear your cry for mercy, that sound induces out of heaven the sound for victory. Many of us will want victory, but the Lord is looking for mercy. If you pray for mercy, upon the sons of disobedience, if you pray for mercy in the lives of other people, the sound of liberation will come into your own life. The Bible says, so unto yourselves in righteousness and you will reap in mercy. It is time for us to turn around, to stop looking in the distance, to see whether we will catch a glimpse of the Lord, whereas the Lord is very present with us. You need to turn around immediately and recognize that you don't need a 30 minute ramp of praise and worship before you begin to pray. Recognize that the Lord is so present that every moment that you have, you can engage him and you should. You see, when someone is that close to you, the Bible says it is forbidden for you in the day of adversity to go seeking for your brother who is far away when your friend is next door. The Bible says it is forbidden. Before the Lord, it is an abomination for you to go look for help in the distance when your, your neighbor is just right there. And so we're looking to the way that God moved in the past and we want to reenact the wonders of the past. We're singing about the old time religion and God is saying, you know, forget about all the rudiments. Just recognize that I am here and begin to engage me. I want to hear your sound and you will hear my sound. I'm going to give you one more verse of scripture from the book of Micah but let me warn you this verse of scripture that I'm about to share with you it does things to people so if you think you're going to miss your old way of life you may want to block your ears right now because this is an invitation for you to come and truly live as a new man come with me to Micah chapter 1 verse 6 Simply because we cannot continue to love our old ways. We cannot continue to love powerlessness and complacency. We need to come up higher because the Lord is that very present help in time of need. I want to encourage you, pray often, pray always. Ask the Lord to show you great and mighty things that you do not know. The Lord says, I will show them. They will see. Father, in Jesus' name, now look at what he says. Micah chapter 1 verse 6. He says, therefore, I will make Samaria a heap of ruins in the field, places for planting a vineyard. I will pour down her stones into the valley. I will uncover her foundations. All her carved images shall be beaten to pieces, and all her pay as a hallowed shall be burned with fire. All her idols I will lay desolate, for she has gathered it with the pay of a harlot, and they shall return to the pay of her harlot. This is where the Lord God Almighty himself revealed what has been standing between us and him. When the Lord God came in the person of the Lord Jesus Christ, the Bible says the word of the Lord became flesh and dwelt amongst men, and we beheld this glory. After he was taken up into the heavens, the apostles were on fire, particularly after they received the baptism of the Holy Spirit or the infilling of the Holy Spirit. Jesus baptized them to equip them for the infilling. And when they received that power that came from on high, nothing could stop them. But then after a while, because men were more fascinated by the works than they were by the Lord, all that which was divinely orchestrated through encounters with the Holy Spirit was reduced to idols representing what was. And we call that religion. And by religion, we have engaged the world. Religion and religious practices are the prostitution of the church. That is the way the church has been able to engage the world for a pay. 
Remember when Apostle Paul and his partner were ministering. I believe it was Bart, it was Silas. They got to a place and they saw that men were selling statue, statues of gods and goddesses. And they came together, the businessmen, they were like, we need to shut down these evangelists because they are teaching people to worship God in spirit and in truth. They will no longer need these idols. They will run us out of business. Now I'm going to say this without any fear of contradiction. Because those people, there was no record of them repenting. The people who wanted to continue to make their statues, what statues were they making? They were making statues of Diana. They didn't want to go away. So what did they do? All of what happened, the Bible says the foundations will be removed. So 70 AD came and the Romans came and removed the foundations of the temple that had become an idol to the people. They saw the Lord Jesus. They did not believe because they could not stop believing in the temple. They sacrificed the Lord Jesus for the sake of the temple and the Lord God Almighty. He said, I will remove those foundations and they will go into prostitution. And from that moment onwards, that which is supposed to be faith in the heart of men became idols and statues on the walls of temples. And the prostitution began. 300 years after the Lord Jesus went to the cross for your sins and mine. And after he was raised up unto the Father, the church became an idol worshiping church again, bowing to statues of Diana that has been rebranded Mary. And from that moment onwards, we have been prostituting. We do the things that the world wants. We don't organize meetings that do not result in profit. When we organize conferences, somebody has to make money. When we organize church meetings, somebody has to make money. Simply because that is the way the world runs. And the Lord is saying, this is not what I called you to. And if you will come back to me, you can't bring that dirty money here. And those dirty practices, you need to give them up. You need to repent. You need to turn your ways around and come as people that want to give to the Lord as opposed to people that want to receive their pay from the world. We cannot make it about what we get anymore. That is the mentality of the prostitute. We need to make it about what we can give. How can I pour this life out as an offering? Jesus says, greater love has no man than this, than for a man to lay down his life for his friends. I pray that this understanding will sink deep into our hearts so that when we pray, we will not pray as beggars, but we will pray as intercessors. That we will pray as people who know they stand with God. People who recognize that God is always there and looking for witnesses that will declare his mercy. Because the moment you assume that position, guess what begins to happen? Then your chains are no longer your problem. They become his responsibility. God is looking for people who will make his business their business. Because then he will make your business his business. You let the Lord use you to bring obedience to the hearts of men and your own children will start to obey you even before you speak. They will do things and you're like, did I tell you to do that? I was thinking, they're like, ah, I just did it. Yeah, because someone somewhere who's turned their backs on the almighty God is repenting. And the Lord is saying, yeah, now you have credit. We can just keep approving things for you. So one more thing, we're gonna break bread. And this time around, we're gonna break bread with another Psalm. The book of Psalms 96. <laughs> And I pray that in the mighty name of Jesus that your eyes will be open to see this weapon, this tool that God himself forged in the place of love to be a weapon in the hand of the believer. I was trying to describe the weapon because I can see it. They have a pet name for it, kind of like a code name for this weapon. This weapon is called a magnifier. This magnifier is like a machine that magnifies your effort in the natural because whatever you're doing is going to be multiplied by the coefficient of the grace of God. Psalms 96 verse 1. And what does it say? It says, Oh, sing to the Lord a new song. Sing to the Lord all 
the earth. Verse 4 says, For the Lord is great and greatly to be praised. He is to be feared above all gods. I'm encouraging you today. Arm yourself with the weapon of praise. You see, when you sing to the Lord, why do we sing to God? So that God can be great in our situation. You see, God is great <laughs> because the Bible says in Him all things consist. But for you to feel and to experience the greatness of God in your life, you have to make Him great in your life. When you praise God, what are you doing? You are magnifying the Lord. The Bible says God inhabits the praises of, you, of His people. So the way it works is that you and Satan, you're on a seesaw. You know, is that what they call that thing, seesaw? You get up, the person's wait there. Yeah, and so you're trying to get up in life, but Satan keeps weighing you down. You want to get up, he weighs you down. Guess what happens? You just need the weight of God to come to your side. And then you see the enemy being sent flying in the skies and it comes crashing down. That was what Jesus said. He said, I see Satan fall like lightning. But that Satan was just here. So how did he fall? He was knocked out into the skies. Lost his entire balance and he came down crumbling. You need the weight of God on your side and that is the reason why you sing the praises of God. When you are praying for people, don't pray as a beggar. Pray as an intercessor who is also confident that whatever it is that you have asked, the Lord has done it. These days, I no longer pray. In fact, I can't remember the last time I prayed without ending my prayer in thanksgiving. Because it's just faith. Unless I don't believe that the Lord has heard me. But the Bible says, well, be careful for nothing. That means don't be anxious about anything. Philippians chapter 4 verse 6. He says, be anxious about nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your request be made known unto God. So you pray, you supplicate, and then you give thanks. Supplication simply means an humbled prayer. So in case you're wondering what that is, like, oh my God, I have to go to school for that? No, it's a humbled prayer. A prayer that recognizes that your weight is not enough. That brings God's weight to the situation. That's what supplication is. And so how do you do that? You give the Lord praise and the Bible says it will show up in its greatness. And the other gods will excuse themselves from your situation because they're like, oh my God, the battle is no longer fair now. He's got God on his side. I'm going to go find those other people who are godless. They're easy. One of my cousins told me this a while ago. He said a man without God is like a chicken in the enemy's cage. At any point in time, it can become dinner on the table. If you are without God, the devil can snatch you at any time. But when you are with God, nobody can handle you because God is bigger than them all. And so I want to encourage you as we break bread today that whatever impediments may have been keeping your heart from being loose in the presence of the Lord. Uh, this is a real prayer. I want you to look at me one minute. In all humility, David says, my soul shall make a boast in the Lord. The humble will hear of it and be glad. One of the things that I have desired of the Lord, which I have sought him concerning, is that I become an example to the believer. You know that correct translation of the word, be an example, is not be an example of a believer. Now, now that's what a lot of us used to quote. But when you look at the scripture, it says be an example, not of, but to the believer. Other believers need to see your example and recognize that this is how to do it. And by the grace of God, God has given me the privilege of being able to model here what it means to surrender oneself to the worship of God. You see, there is a wind that is in the presence of God and you need to move to that wind. But many of us, when we are doing praise and worship, this is how we stand. We are standing because of the fact that we are not in surrender. And it shows in our posture. Many of us, we don't want to sing because we don't want to hurt somebody else's ears. Okay, but you're not going to hurt God's ears if you pray. In fact, if everybody's singing, nobody's going to hear Laura's voice. You understand what I mean? And I'm not saying her voice hurts the ear. I'm just saying that because of where she's sitting in the back, you can't hear if you are screaming on top of your voice. How will you hear what's coming from the back? No. We need to learn to do that. You see, because there is power in the presence of God. Let us enjoy the Lord's body and drink of his blood in remembrance of him. 
We say those things not because we want to scare anybody, but because that's exactly what Jesus said. He says, this is my body. This is my blood. He says, if you do not drink of the blood of the Son of Man, and if you do not eat of his flesh, you have no part in him. And so because Jesus kept using these words, we use the word also. He took the bread, he says, this is my body. He took the wine, he says, this is my blood. He said also, as often as you have the opportunity, do this in remembrance of me. We call every aspect of our existence to remembrance whenever we break bread. Everything within you that has the tendency to doubt, doubts because by God, they were meant to believe. And so lose the negative tendencies. Embrace the positive tendencies. Let everything within you be reminded of who to believe and what to believe. You believe the Lord and you believe his word. So that going forward, you're not wrestling with obeying God. You're obeying God seamlessly because you believe. The people who believe, we obey. We only disobey because we're doubting whether the outcome is guaranteed or doubting whether the person means well. I'm not sure why you're asking me to do that. But when you believe the Lord, then you will obey his word. So Lord, in the mighty name of Jesus, may we turn around and see that you are close. May we not just hear what you say, but may we behold your beauty. May we see the unconditional love in your heart for your children and may we allow our hearts to beat with the same rhythm so that we can love others as we love ourselves so that we can love ourselves as you love us and love others the same so that we recognize that you are all that we need so by loving ourselves we demonstrate that love by depending on you more and by seeking you more and as we eat of the Lord's body today and drink of his blood, let us be awake unto righteousness and sin no more. In the mighty name of Jesus, you may eat of the Lord's body and drink of his blood. Hallelujah. I'm gonna just pray for everybody. I know some people will experience this immediately and some will experience it even more intensely than the others. Because some have already started experiencing it. But this is what the Lord is saying to me. I saw a man sitting, and the angel of the Lord said to him, close the book and look here. Close the book and look here. The book represents records, things that have happened. Many of us are limiting our own understanding of God based on the things that have happened to us because we keep a record of everything. Many of you, you pray and you really don't believe. Why? Because you have once prayed and you didn't think your prayer was answered. So you put a limit on how much you trust God. There was a time that you were feeling ill in your body and you prayed. Even the pastor came from across town and laid hands on you and you were still sick. And since then, whenever you have infirmity, you don't have the confidence to pray. You're like, I'm going to just use a Tylenol. Because you are keeping record of the things that didn't go your way. And the Lord is saying, close the book and look here. God, by the ministry of his angels, wants to encourage your faith by revealing to you the possibilities that are available in the season that we're in. Sometimes you don't necessarily have to change what you're doing, but you would have a different result because change has come. The Bible says the race is not to the swift, the battle is not to the strong, but time and chance happens to them all. Even the Lord Jesus respected his time. When Mary said, hey, dude, do something. He says, woman, what have I to do with you? My time has not come. And the Lord is saying, look here because the time has come. So I pray for you in the mighty name of Jesus that every record that you have kept against the Lord, that every record that you have kept against the word of God, that every record of unbelief and disappointments that are in your subconscious mind, keeping your faith from having wings to fly, that by obedience you will close the records and once again look to the author and the finisher of your faith. Because the Bible says with him, nothing shall be impossible. Believe once again. Let your faith arise. Yes, let it arise. Thank you, Lord, because you hear me always. I was seeking the Lord 
many days now concerning you that your faith will rise. And now that the word of the Lord has come, I know for a sure, for a surety that your faith will rise. You will believe again and you will have results in the mighty name of Jesus. Ah, oh, man, you need to rent the card of disappointment. This time around, I'm actually going to call some people out and just pray for them because it is not it is not what God wants you to hold on to. Yes, you held on to it because of self-preservation and the Lord is saying, no, it is time for you to destroy the picture of disappointment. Bonita, let me pray for you. You see, because by reason of the anointing, it's going to be easy to do that which the Lord is saying to do, to let go. So I pray for you that in the mighty name of Jesus, if you don't mind, you don't even have to come here. Just stand where you're at. And let the power from an eye rest mightily upon you and allow for you to move past the limitations that have been set by past experiences. The Lord is doing a new thing. God bless you. Sit down. Again, it's one of those things that the Lord Jesus is coming to do. He says, behold, I come. My reward is with me and I make all things new. Are you preparing your heart for new things? Then you have to let go of the old because nobody pulls new wine into an old wine skin because both of them will be lost. So you need a new wine skin, a new set of beliefs and your belief system changes in the process of repentance. And there is not many things God is asking for you at this meeting. He's only asking for you to turn around and recognize that he is near. May you catch that revelation of what it means for the Lord to be near. Because then you will engage him, you will rely on him, you will eat from his hand, and you will also give him your praise. In the mighty name of Jesus. One last thing that we're going to pray and that we're going to close completely. Alan, get ready to come and bless the offering. Is in Matthew chapter 11, verse 11. And I believe that somebody is sitting here and you're, you're having a conversation with the Lord about this subject. And so let me just help you here with this. Now, I don't usually say this, but this is an express word. Look at what it says. It says, Assuredly, I say to you, amongst those born of women, there has not risen one greater than John the Baptist. But he who is the least in the kingdom of God is greater than he. Praise the Lord. I am thankful for the ministry of the Holy Spirit because this was one of the very first things the Lord showed me the moment I got on stage. Perspective. Right? So get ready. I'm going to be speaking to you more geometrically in days to come. I should have been aware of it because the Lord told me that it was coming. Wherein things will be almost like geometry. You have to understand perspectives. So the Lord said concerning John the Baptist that of all the children born of women, none ever has been greater than John. Not Enoch. Well, let's not say Enoch. Not Abraham. Not Noah. And there's a reason why I said let's not say Enoch, but I don't want to get into that today. But children born of women, none greater than John. And Jesus says now that John is here, even the least in the kingdom will be greater than he that is because of how close we will be to the Lord. You might be a giant that is 37 feet tall if you are standing in bucket right now and I can manage to see you, you will be like a little speck. But you can be three foot nothing and seem taller because you're close to me. The Lord said that so that they will know how close he was. Even your little self and my little self the Bible says that we are greater than John because of how close the Lord is to us. God's proximity is everything that we need. Let that sink and do something about it. God bless you. Uh, hallelujah. Um, bro, if you will help us with the Offer slide. Thank you, sir. All right, and we'll prepare our hearts for giving. And you'll see the details there. We'll give us a couple of seconds. We have several ways that you can give. And let tonight's giving be in faith. Let it be as a sign of our worship unto the Lord and what He's done in us what he's ministered to us tonight. 
what a privilege it is. Father, we give you praise. And if you need an envelope, we have them here, or you can see me right after and I can grant you one and you can fill it out there. Father, we give you praise. We love you. We thank you, O oh God, for allowing us or granting us entry into your presence, O oh God. We love you. Lord, we thank you for your, your word, which is sweet, is perfect, O oh God. For your word declares where two or three are gathered together in your name. There you are in the midst of them. Father, we thank you for how you dealt with us tonight. Now, Lord, move in our hearts. For, Lord, we know that you love the cheerful giver. Help us, O oh God, to give. Lord, as you grow us in our hearts, O oh God, as you grow us in you, O oh God, as we seek after as we pursue you, O oh God, being more and more like you day after day. Father, we give you praise for we know that you grant unto the sower seed. And so, Lord, let these seeds be pleasing in your sight. Let them be sweet smelling in the mighty name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Praise God. Praise God. We'll be back at it Saturday. But don't forget, join us Wednesday, Instagram Live. 9 p.m. We've been tapping in. We've been seeing. We thank God for what he's been doing in there. So even as the man of God has encouraged us to press into prayer in that midnight hour, come build yourself up with us in a corporate setting online. We'll do that again tomorrow night, 9 p.m. That'll be every Wednesday. But we'll see everyone back this Saturday. All righty. Y'all have a blessed week.